Well, uh, now that we've moved to Nashville, coming back here, the, all this just feels like home. So this is maybe a little overboard, but thank you. It's great. So as we're continuing, as Brandon said in the series that you all started on the Sermon on the Mount, Brandon thought it'd be a great idea for me to deal with the topic of murder. So here we go. Here we go. Uh, one of the things that, that I talk about often is uh, what I like to refer to as Christ formation. I believe that is the goal of the Christian life. It begins at the moment of salvation and then goes on for the rest of this life until we die in it with Jesus. Specifically, Christ formation is about taking on the character of Christ. And that's an inside-out process. Probably the easiest way to think about that is the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Those are aspects of Jesus' character that we are taking on more and more as we grow in our relationship with him. And what's important to understand is that becoming like Jesus isn't something that we are supposed to try really, really hard to do. It's a byproduct of our relationship with him. As we cultivate greater intimacy with Jesus, spending time with him and his people, we start to take on his character. So think of character as something that is more caught than taught. And throughout scripture, you will see this kind of golden thread woven that is uh, pointing to the need for there to be integrity between what is going on in our hearts and what is taking place in our behavior. And so what we're going to look at this morning in regard to murder specifically is that the, the Pharisees, the rabbis of Jesus' day, had, had made a disconnect. There was a, a breach, if you will, between what they did and why they did it. And so they assumed that, and taught actually the people, that as long as you adhere to certain behaviors, then you're good. And Jesus then comes along and says, whoa, 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 whoa. God is not just interested in what we do. He's also interested in why we do what we do. There is a need for spiritual integrity that is the result of our, of our time with Jesus. It, it reminds me, this need for integrity reminds me of this uh, story that some of you may be familiar with. Uh, it was a, uh, of a sailor by the name of Michael Plant. Uh, he was a popular American yachtsman. He had circumnavigated the globe, and in the fall of 1992... He set sail from the United States for a solo transatlantic crossing into, into France. For him, this was kind of a routine deal. His vessel was the state-of-the-art sailboat called the Coyote. The Coyote was second to none in its equipment. Its hull was made of the finest materials. Its electronics were state-of-the-art. Its guidance system was second to none. It had a tracking system that was directly linked uh, to satellites in the event of emergency. Plant had everything that he needed, all the expertise, all the experience, all the equipment for a routine run to France. But 11 days into the voyage, all contact with the coyote was lost. Now, initially, radio science wasn't a big deal. Plant was known to be a kind of independent guy, and most people just assumed he was in rough seas, and that was kind of keeping him busy. But after a few more days of no contact, they set out a search party. It was true that he had hit a severe storm, but as some of you probably know, being sailors, that sailboats are probably the most you know, buoyant of all sea vessels. If they, they tip over, even capsize, they can right themselves back up. So, you know, that, that didn't seem to make a lot of sense. When the Coyote was built, in addition to that, an 8,400-pound uh, weight was attached to its keel, making it almost impossible for the uh, coyote to capsize. And yet, when it was found, the boat was upside down, that weight had broken away from the keel, and plant had been lost. There was a breach of integrity at what was underneath, what was going on beneath the waterline. Everything on top looked good. State-of-the-art everything, experienced sailor and everything. And yet, below the waterline, there was a breach of integrity between the weight and the keel, and the boat was lost. 
In a similar way, I believe that spiritual integrity is important to God. That there is no difference, no compromise, no disconnect between our heart and our behavior. That's what God is looking to sync up. That is what is important to him. And we see this value of spiritual integrity in a number of different places throughout Scripture. Let me just give you a couple examples. In 1 Kings 9.4, when God appears to Solomon, he says, As for you, if you walk before me with integrity of heart and uprightness, as David your father did, and do all I command and observe my decrees and laws, I will establish your royal throne over Israel forever. In 1 Chronicles 29, 11, David said to the Lord, I know, my God, that you test the hearts and are pleased with integrity. So there is a value in the kingdom of God for there to be integrity between not only what we do, but why we do what we do. And that is a matter of the heart that God is very interested in. I also believe that spiritual integrity is most visible in our relationships. Spiritual integrity is when my love for God is in alignment with my love for others. And my love for others is in alignment with my love for God. And again, this is an inside-out process. Now, there's various elements you're going to be looking at throughout the rest of this series in the Sermon on the Mount that you could refer to these different categories uh, of things that are coming, like adultery and divorce and making commitments, going the extra mile, loving our enemies, giving to the needy, right? These are some of the topics that are coming up in the greatest sermon ever preached. <clears throat> and you can see these as elements of spiritual in integrity. And we could talk about a lot of different ones, but I get the privilege to start with the very first one about murder. So let's get into it. There's an element of spiritual integrity of, of murder that most of us probably don't realize. So we're in uh, Matthew 5, verses 21 to 26. Look what Jesus says in verse 21. You've heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. Now, Jesus is going to use this phrase, you have heard it said to the people long ago, uh, over and over and over again throughout the rest of this sermon. And what he is referring to is the oral teachings of the law that were passed down uh, by the rabbis uh, over the years. And, of course, this command, do not murder, is the sixth commandment of, of God's top ten. Now, most of us are probably thinking, well, okay, if, if not murdering someone is a sign of spiritual integrity, I'm doing pretty good. Because last time I checked, I haven't murdered anybody, right? But before you start fist bumping and high-fiving, we got to get into verse 22. Because Jesus is going to say some things that are going to be disturbing. Look what he says. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. What in the world's going on here? Well, the religious leaders uh, over the years, up to the time of Jesus, took it upon themselves to interpret and define God's law. And their definition of the sixth commandment uh, is one of just many different examples. Essentially, they had reduced murder only to the literal act of taking the life of another person. So if you hadn't literally killed someone, if you hadn't stabbed them in the heart with a knife or thrown them off of a cliff, then you hadn't committed murder. And by default, you could consider yourself morally superior to those who had done that. And that's what these religious leaders were doing. They were thinking, hey, the Sixth Commandment says do not murder. That means do not take literally the life of another person. Well, I've never done that, so I'm doing pretty good. I'm righteous before God. He's lucky to have me on his team. How spiritual I am. And they taught the people the same thing. 
So it was all based on externals. It wasn't focusing on the motive or the intent of the heart. It was only focused on the outward expression. So if you keep God's law as we define it, they're saying, and this is what they talk to the people, if you keep God's law as we define it, then you will be righteous before God like us. The problem was, in order to adhere to all of the ways that the Pharisees and the, and the religious leaders of the day were teaching this, it was a full-time job, literally. So if you had, you know, to, to work for a living, which everybody else did, you were sunk. You wouldn't have the capacity, the time, or the ability to do all the things that they were saying that you had to do. And then Jesus come along, comes along and he blows this whole system up. And he tells them, the Pharisees and the people, that God's laws have a much broader meaning than they ever imagined and includes the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And that's exactly what Jesus gets to here in verse 22. He unpacks the full definition of the sixth commandment. He tells the people what murder is and has always been from the moment that God gave the command to Moses on Mount Sinai. And it's important to remember that Jesus is not adding anything. Uh, Instead, he's telling the people that the religious leaders had only given them a very narrow part of it. So in verse 22, Jesus goes on to give the full definition of murder as defined by God, and it includes four different forms. The first form is killing, which is literally taking someone's life. That's obvious. It's the unlawful, premeditated killing of another human being. So obviously God considers that murder. But the second form Jesus refers to as anger. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Now, the word here for anger means to rage or to burn up or to foam with anger. It's the anger that results in brooding over an offense. It's a hurt that you just won't let go of, that you won't forgive. It's this simmering bitterness that consumes you. This type of anger is so powerful that over time, it can even cause you to essentially demonize your offender, uh, where you convince yourself that they are the devil incarnate, and so they get what they deserve. And so if they trip and fall down the stairs and break their neck, well, that's what they deserved. There's no empathy. There's no compassion. They reaped what they sowed. This type of anger is the root of bitterness that the writer in Hebrews talks about. Look at Hebrews 12, 15. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. So Jesus is saying here what you think he's saying, that I can murder someone with this type of anger. But he doesn't stop there. He keeps going. There's a third form that he refers to as insults. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. Now, this, that word insult here is an Aramaic word that when translated into English is the word uh, raka. It means to hold a person in utter contempt, uh, it, to express a deep-seated hatred for them. The purpose of such contempt is to make that other person feel completely worthless. It's to humiliate and alienate them from other people. When you insult someone, as Jesus is defining it, you're not content to be the only person that hates them. You want everyone to feel exactly the same way about them as you do. And you make it your mission to make that possible. Insults have cruel social consequences that rip open the heart and ravage the soul. That's why God includes insults with his definition of murder. And then the final form of murder, according to God, is to call a person a fool. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. Now, the word here, the Greek word here for fool is moros, which is where we obviously get the word moron from. The word literally means stupid or foolish or silly. It's an attack on the person's character. 
but it's, it's difficult for, for me to translate for you how offensive that word, would have, that, that word would have been in Jesus' day without losing my title as a pastor. So just think, just think of the absolute worst swear word you can and put fool after it, and you got what we're talking about here. It was unbelievably offensive. So to brand someone as a fool is to combine all the intensity of anger with all the contempt of an insult in one word. In fact, Jesus said that to call someone a fool was so egregious that the offender was liable to the fires of hell. So as you're seeing these four different forms, you might be wondering, so Ken, wait a second, are are you saying that all four of these forms are equally egregious to God? Yes. Now, obviously, they have different social consequences. So if you literally take someone's life today, you're going to go to prison. Whereas if you call someone a fool, there's a different social consequence. But in God's economy of things, in the kingdom of God, God sees murder that as all of these forms. So do you see how this is turning upside down everything the Pharisees were teaching the people? This is going to the heart, literally, of the matter. So let's just stop for a second, take a breath, pretty heavy stuff. Here's what I'm thinking. Man, if Jesus is defining murder this broadly, then I'm a murderer. And you know what? You know where I'm going with this. So are you. We are all murderers at the end of the day. And that's exactly the point. Aren't you glad you came to church today? (laughs) But here's the good news. You ready for some of that? Here's the good news. Jesus is standing in front of us with a big old sign that says, Murderers, welcome. My grace is sufficient. My forgiveness will cleanse you, even from murder. And I was telling Brandon that as I was kind of looking over this passage again this morning, it struck me that murder is the first of these elements that you're going to be talking about. Why is that? Well, I, I don't know exactly, but I, I wonder if murder is first because it's the one that we think that we're, we're okay with. That we're clear. We're in the clear in regard to murder. But when I discover the fact that I am indeed a murderer, and when you realize the same, it should take away every trace of self-righteousness that we would have. Every ounce of moral superiority that we might think we would have over someone else. And cause us to just run to the cross. To run to Jesus and to throw ourselves at his feet, asking for forgiveness and his mercy and his grace. Because even the one command that I thought I had never broken, the one that I thought I could hang my self-righteous hat on, I realize now I am guilty of. I have actually murdered people, many people over the years. With my anger, with my hatred, with my harsh words. I have gossiped. I have assassinated people's character by causing others to think less of them. And sometimes it's so very subtle. I've murdered so many people over the years, I can't even count the number. And so have you. I mean, just think about it. Think about when we were kids on the playground. We were all a bunch of mass murderers. (laughs) Right? Oh, you're such a jerk, you moron, you're so stupid, four eyes, you're so gay, right? Remember all those things that we used to call each other and be called? Trying to make others feel socially inferior to us, trying to elevate ourselves in the crowd so that we can feel good about ourselves. Man, we need a savior. We need Jesus. Because we are guilty of murder. So if you think that children 
are morally pure and innocent, think again. I have three grandchildren. Two, their twins are five, and the baby is three. And if you think that, uh, if I ever have a doubt that my grandchildren aren't perfect, just put them in the room with one toy and see how long that goes. There will be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth within three minutes. promise you. As a murderer, if I were to get what I deserved, it would be the fires of hell. That's how serious this is. And I got to tell you, I am really grateful that God's not fair. Because he doesn't give us what we deserve. He gives us grace. He gives us forgiveness and cleanses us makes us as white as snow. If, if you want to actually see the sober truth about every one of us, it's right here in Romans 3, 10 to 18. Listen to what Paul says. He says, no one is righteous, not even one. No one is truly wise. No one is seeking God. All have turned away. All have become useless. No one does good, not a single one. Their talk is foul like the stench from an open grave. Their tongues are filled with lies. Snake venom drips from their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. They rush to commit murder. Destruction and misery always follows them. They don't know where to find peace, and they have no fear of God at all. Wow. This is why Jesus came to earth 2,000 years ago. To pay the price for sin. My sin, your sin. The sin of the whole world. So that whoever put their faith in him would be forgiven. Would be indwelt by the spirit of God. Would begin a process of transformation that would lead them more and more into the likeness of Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus came. That's, that's the fullness of the gospel. Paul says in Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's good news. And when you really get this, when you really allow the love of God to permeate every crevice of your heart, it will change you from the inside out. It will result in gratefulness and joy. And God's desire is for us to become the kind of people that are no longer interested in murdering others. It's not that he wants us to just try really, really hard the next opportunity we have to not murder somebody. He wants us to become the kind of people that are not even interested in that. Do you see the difference? One is a character formation, and the other is behavior management. Or as Dallas Willard likes to say, sin management. God's not interested in sin management. He's not interested in you and I trying really, really, really hard to not mess up next time. He's interested in changing us from the inside out so that our behavior is in alignment with our heart, so that there is integrity there. And it's his love that transforms us. And so as we continue to internalize God's love, it changes us from the inside out. It's a miraculous dynamic. Uh, in my latest book, Unhindered Abundance, I talk about, the, basically the, this whole book is about the Christ formation process. And I think it's important to really be specific about what we're talking about. But on page 9, I write, to become more like Jesus Christ includes two lifelong experiences. First, it involves taking on the facets of his character that are most easily identified as the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It's important to recognize that the fruit of the Spirit is singular, not plural. The first fruit of the Spirit is love. The byproduct of love is the rest, joy, peace, Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. This understanding of love as the fruit of the Spirit takes us to the second experience of Christ formation, which is the abundant life. 
As we internalize, here's the point, as we internalize the reality of God's love in increasing measure, we will begin to experience a different quality of life, a life characterized by the fruit of the Spirit. This is the abundant life. And the more we abide in Jesus' love, the more like Jesus we will become and the more we will experience the abundant life. Character, Christ-like character, is more caught than taught. This is why Jesus invites us at the moment of salvation to come follow him, to come be with him. What's implied in that invitation is far more than just following Jesus around. What's implied there is that I want you to come be with me, Jesus says, for the purpose of becoming like me. So this whole idea that the gospel is about having your sin forgiven so that you go to heaven when you die is only a part of the gospel. It's not the whole thing. I would suggest to you that the whole thing has to include this Christ formation process, this ongoing transformation from the inside out. And the good news is that the Spirit of God is the primary agent of change. And so we have this partnership, this limited partnership, if you will, with the Holy Spirit. But he's doing the heavy lifting of the internal change. But we participate in that. And then I go into all the specifics of that as I see them in, 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 in my book. But here's, here's the big idea. The big idea is all of this is the, the reason for all of this. The reason for this need of integrity between heart and behavior is because of God's character of love. 1 John 4, 8 says God is love. John could have used a lot of words to describe the character of God. He could have used holiness, righteousness. He could have used you know, goodness. He could have used all kinds of different words, but he chose love. Maybe as the umbrella character of God from which all the others come underneath. So the more I am transformed into the image of Christ through the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit, the more loving I will become because God is love. In fact, that may be the best metric for you and I to measure our progress. Our progress in spiritual maturity. Am I becoming more loving? Am, am I more loving today? than I was yesterday? Am I, am I more gracious with people? Am I more willing to forgive? Those are all aspects of the divine work that God is doing in us. Spiritual integrity becomes more evidence in my life by outward expressions of God's love for others. If there is a break between your love for God and your love for others, something's off. You can't say, James, James talks about uh, this all, all over the book of James. If you say you love God but hate your brother, you're a liar. So there has to be this outward expression, this practical application, if you will, of this dynamic in my relationship with God and this love relationship that I have with him. And one expression of God's love that pertains to this whole discussion, it's what Jesus goes on to talk about, is the word, is reconciliation. When there is a breach in relationship with others, God's desire is for reconciliation. Because he is the God of reconciliation. In fact, I would suggest that the core of the gospel is about reconciliation. It's about bringing back, God bringing back what sin has broken and scattered, him bringing back into wholeness. Look what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 to 20. Therefore, if, any, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. All this, all this process of new creation, he says, is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Don't miss that. Our mission now as followers of Christ is to carry out this ministry of reconciliation that we have experienced and received from him. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them, and he, was, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf to be reconciled to God. 
You, you see the word reconcile over and over and over again. Now, there's a number of ways that we could apply all of this to our lives. Uh, but let me just wrap up with three uh, principles that I hope we can take away in regard to reconciliation as an expression of this spiritual integrity we're talking about here. The first, principle number one, is to make reconciliation a priority. This is what Jesus get, gets out to here in verses 23 and 24. He says, so if you're offering your gift on, at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. I, I just believe that God desires us to live at peace with all people. But God especially desires that we live in peace with each other as believers, as brothers and sisters in Christ. Notice Jesus specifically refers to the offended party here as a brother. I think the idea is that as believers, if you're at odds with another Christian, you need to do everything that you can that is in your power to reconcile that relationship. Now, that doesn't mean it's always going to get reconciled, but everything in your power, in my power, is to, is to be invested in reconciling that relationship. And notice that this is to take pry over over everything, even worship. That's how important this is. The offering that Jesus is referring to here, that they were giving, was a voluntary offering. It was, a, it was an offering that was expressing a desire uh, to be close to God or as a means of expressing your gratitude and love for God. But how can you do that with any integrity if you're at odds with your Christian brother? It just doesn't work. It doesn't make sense. You can't walk closely with God and be at odds with a brother or sister in Christ. You can't walk closely with God and at the same time be at odds with a brother and sister in Christ. This is how big a deal reconciliation is. In fact, I would suggest if you go to John 17, in Jesus' high priestly prayer, the very last thing that he prays for is unity within the body of Christ, within his family. That God desires that we be unified. And friends, let me just, as a, as a just sidestep this real quick. The next five months is going to be some of the most vitriolic, hate-filled, divisive times we have ever seen politically. And I believe that our job is to be peacemakers in the midst of that. It doesn't, it, 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 we, we have to be the ones that help each other see that the relationship is more important than your political affiliation. That the relationship is more important than some offense that you carried out against me. And I want to reconcile with you. Being unified doesn't mean that the other person is right and you're wrong or you're right and they're wrong. I really think that we have to check being right at the door. And instead, live graciously with one another. Be patient with one another. Recognize that you may not be right about everything. That there may be a bigger picture here. And the very, at the very least, here's what I want us to remember these next five months. God is in control. He is the one that opposes and deposes. He is the one that puts leaders in position and takes leaders out. You can trust that. You don't have to have clarity on why or why not. You just have to have faith and just to trust that God's on the job. He hasn't fallen asleep at the wheel, regardless of who wins the election, regardless of who's even running to win for the election. He's in charge, and we can trust that. And therefore, we can walk together as brothers and sisters in Christ, regardless of what side of the political aisle that we're on. I found this quote from Matthew Henry's commentary that I thought was helpful. 
we ought carefully to preserve Christian love and peace with our brethren, and that if at any time a breach happens, we should labor for a reconciliation by confessing our fault, humbling ourselves to our brother, begging his pardon, and making restitution. Some of the wording there is a little old, but I, you get the point. This is something we have to pursue and be intentional about. So we need to make reconciliation a priority. Principle number two is to make reconciliation as soon as possible. Verse 25, Jesus says, Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard, and you be put in prison. So don't delay as soon as possible. And then number three, regardless of who's at fault, you take the initiative. I believe that's an outcome of spiritual maturity. I really do. That regardless of whether I've been offended or not, that my job is to take the initiative to bring about reconciliation, to start that conversation. Jesus says, if, your brother has, if you know your brother has something against you, leave your gift there and go. Even if you know they have something against you, leave it and go. In both cases, Jesus tells us to take the initiative and to not wait for the other person to act first. Reconciliation is not something that we will lean into on our own or naturally. It is something that we need the Spirit of God to be at work in us to do. Because our natural bent is to, especially when we've been offended, is to make that other person bad and to essentially murder them. That's our preference because they hurt us. Our brain goes into enemy mode. And now we want to get our pound of flesh. But that is not the inside-out work of God that he wants to do. Some of you know my story, because uh, you either know me or because you've, you've read my book. But 10 years ago, the elders at the church that I was serving as senior pastor decided it was time for me to leave. And I didn't agree, and so they fired me. And that launched me into a season of feeling unbelievably betrayed, hurt, angry, confused, bitter, resentful. I mean, it was a truckload of, of it all. And uh, we lived about a mile and a half from Salt Creek. And the first few months, I would go down there in the wee hours of the morning, even before the surfers got there, the dolphins weren't even up yet. And I would just cry out to the Lord. I would just, Lord, what is going to happen? I, I thought life was over. My 27 years of ministry was over. I was serving at a church that I loved. That was, oh, I mean, it just everything. It was like I hit a brick wall going 100 miles an hour. And I was depressed. I was anxious. I was fearful. It was a cocktail of pain. And so I'm sitting there one morning, I'll never forget this, I'm pouring my heart out to God, and I feel like the Lord said to me, Ken, I want you to start a process of reconciliation with the elders. And I was like, excuse me? Lord, you have not obviously been paying attention. They hurt me. They need to initiate with me. I ain't initiating with them. And as I sat there and fumed in this, I feel like he just gently said again, I want you to take the initiative. I was so mad at God, and yet I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, dang it, he's right. And it just so happened that the last series that I preached was an eight-week series on forgiveness. <laughs> and I'm just sitting there, I'm feeling like such a hypocrite. And I, just, I, I was just saying to myself, really, Ken, you're going to not practice what you just preached on for eight weeks? You're not going to live out of the forgiveness that God has extended to you? And I'm not, I'm not saying that they were, I was right and they were wrong. That's not where I'm going with this. I'm going with this as I was feeling absolutely betrayed. And God is telling me to, re to start the reconciliation process. So I'm sitting there. And it was so clear. It's one of those few times in my life 
I've walked with Jesus for 47 years. It's one of the few times in my life where I was so crystal clear that God was saying, because I would never have come up with this on my own, trust me. That's one of the ways that I discern the voice of God. If it's something that I would never come up with on my own, it's like, okay, here we go again. And so I was afraid that if I went home and sent a text or an email to the elders, that I wouldn't do it. And so I sat there, and I composed a text, and I sent it to each of the elders individually. And here's, and here's, all, here's all I said. I said, would you meet with me for coffee? Because I would like to apologize for my part of the process. That's all I said. And over the next three months... I met with each of the elders, and that's what I said. I didn't go into those expecting an apology. I didn't go into those conversations expecting them to go, well, you know, Ken, we could have done some things differently, because I got none of that. But I didn't go in expecting that. I went in as an act of sheer obedience. Not a good attitude, not wanting to do it, but because I knew clearly that's what God wanted me to do. It was one of the hardest things I think I've ever done. But here's, here's why this is important. And I've, I've messed this up so many other times in my life. This is one of the few times that I really think that I, was, I moved in the right direction with the Lord. That resulted in a, re, in a reconciliation service that I believe was very healing, not only for me and my family, but for the church at large. And that's just not something that you can make up, that you can fabricate. Friends, this is not something we do very well as the body of Christ in this world. We tend to shoot our wounded. We tend to to blame and try to cover the offense or to try to manage the situation, to try to control the outcome. We do all that stuff really well. What we don't do so well is come together in reconciliation, come together in humility, come together in apology. Because whenever there is a situation like what I experienced, and and even in a divorce situation, even in an affair situation, whatever place that you have been that you may have experienced betrayal in your life or maybe have betrayed someone else, there's always two parties involved. There's There's always something else going on underneath. And this is something that God has called us to as his ambassadors, is to be initiators of reconciliation. And so I would really just like to spend a minute, for you to spend a minute right now, and just take, just take a sec to reflect and think about who is it that God is maybe tapping you on the shoulder to begin a reconciliation process with. It could be a spouse, a for, an ex-spouse, a former employer. It could be a friend, a family member. It could be any number of different people. Who is it? So I'd just like to give you just 30 seconds. to Just close your eyes, because my guess is you don't need any more than that. Just close your eyes and just ask the Lord, Lord, is there anybody in my life that I need to begin and initiate a reconciliation process with. Let's do that. Lord Jesus, I pray that whomever it was that you brought to mind, Lord, that you would give us just the ability to begin the process. Maybe that begins with a text or an email. Maybe it begins with a a voicemail message, an invitation to coffee. I don't know. 
But Lord, what I do know is that you desire for us to walk in unity. I do know that we are your ambassadors for reconciliation. And so Lord, may you be glorified as we step into obedience to what you are calling us to do, to make amends, to forgive, to let go. Doesn't mean that it's okay. Doesn't mean that it wasn't terribly painful. But Lord, it just means that we're not holding that other person on our hook any longer. We're letting it go. Lord, I pray that this would be an opportunity for us to walk in the light and for there to be an example of integrity between what you're doing in our hearts and then what we live out in our behavior. And I pray this in Jesus' name.